Chief Warrant Officer Terry Glenn Hears, United States Army, Vietnam. I interviewed Terry here in my home. It was December the 22nd, 2007. And uh, Terry was 67 years old at the time. Lost him in 2021 at the age of 80. And uh, Terry actually started in the military in 1957 in the Navy, in the United States Navy. He um, worked with submarines and amphibious forces. And when Vietnam came along, they decided they needed some of these Navy and Coast Guard personnel to work with the Army. So he joined the Army, became a Chief Warrant Officer too. And um, he, he, worked with, uh, he worked on the Delta in Vietnam. They ferried ammunition and uh, gasoline up and down the Delta to, the, to our forces. And they had 65 foot armor plated tugboats that did this with machine guns mounted on these tugboats. And you talk about a unique story. I don't have any stories like this. Terry tells a great story. The fact that he worked with submarines and then came into the army, I, I think that I find that interesting. Most of my warrant officers were helicopter pilots, but he had that rank um, on those tugboats and just tells a great story. I really miss Terry. He's actually here at our local veteran cemetery. I go visit him at times uh, with some of my other veterans who are buried there. But Terry just was a great man and really an unsung hero of Vietnam. I want to thank Sean Johnson. Sean, you wanted a submarine story. I'm getting closer, brother. Thank you for your continued support of my work, Sean. I want to thank you. Look in that camera, salute you. And I appreciate you so much. Uh, you're making it possible for me to continue my work. And that means a lot to me. And I, I say, God bless you for it, brother. Thank you. Folks, if you'd like to donate to this work, there's information on my website in the video description and comment section of, this, of these videos. If you'd like to sponsor a story, that's a special opportunity for you. Um, you can do that also. You can get a hold of me and we can work that out. But I'm just so grateful. My heart's full to share these stories as we continue into 2024. Vietnam, Korea, World War II, even the Gulf War, Iraq and Afghanistan. I've got stories coming up. So just a lot to do this year. And uh, thank you for watching and listening. And we're listening to my radio station, Voices of History Radio, 24 hours a day, folks. It's going good. And uh, thank you for all of you supporting that station too. So it's a labor of love and God bless you for it. Thank you for subscribing to this channel, sharing these videos. And I want you to enjoy Terry here's story. Help me in honoring this man. Amen. Fifty-seven. Fifty-seven. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I was uh, on surface craft for an enlistment plus a little bit. Uh, was actually in Tonkin Gulf in '58 and '61. Never thinking I would be back in country later in my life. And then uh, went to submarines. And uh, during Vietnam, uh, the Army came to the Navy and the Coast Guard looking for engineers and skippers. And uh, a bunch of us thought, why not? And uh, so we went to the Army and became warned officers. And I went to Vietnam in 1969, came out in 70. So what division were you with, company or battalion? Or <coughs> I mean we were, I was actually in a, uh, Provisional, what they called a provisional harbor craft company. It was a very unique, one of a kind unit. Uh, they created sp specifically for Vietnam. We took 65 foot tugboats and we armor plated them and we put 50s and 60s and LAS rockets and the whole, everything we could get our hands on on them. And then we towed ammo and nav gas all over the Delta and all the way up into uh, Tainan. 
So when you went to Vietnam in 69, were you in the States before that and you went over there? Right. So you did a t full tour in Vietnam. Did a full tour. Yeah. Yeah. What was the mood of the country at the time? I mean, was there a lot of protests and things going mm -hmm. on? Or protests going on. People, people uh, were coming out in force against the war. And uh, In my own mind, though, I knew we were doing the right thing. I was not a draftee and I was not a young man. I was 29. But I knew from Cold War things that we had done that uh, we needed we needed to be there. Yeah. And uh, I was confident of that, so I had no qualms about that part of it. What part of Vietnam were you stationed at? Or were you? I was in the Delta. I was uh, outside of Saigon. Uh, we would be deployed out of there daily for daily ops and sometimes longer. Um, our unit functioned mostly out of Na Bay, an area called Na Bay, because all the freighters came up there to unload ammo, and, and uh, mm -hmm. then there were some uh, gas dumps and stuff there that, you know, they bring tankers up and fill up barges with av gas and that type of thing. And when you say operations, what exactly what were your duties, responsibilities, and uh were you ever in, obviously you're in harm's way all the time, but what was your rank at that time too? I uh, was a warrant officer one when I got there. I made W-2 chief warrant officer while I was there. Uh, we, uh, specifically, we, did, we just did a lot of daily tows. We would, wherever they needed supplies. Right from, on that Mekong Delta there? Right, from fire support bases to special dumps for Long Bin and places like that, we would take them up. Uh, then in, the fall of 69, we, uh, you know, the, the VC and the North Vietnamese were uh, making these big camps in Cambodia, up in the Parrot's Beak and the Fishhook area, starting to make major incursions in, into the country. And the major I worked for called us in and said, uh, we want to see if you can get a barge of, of ammo and a barge of gas up to Tain In. It had never been done before, and uh, we think you guys can do it. So we made that first ever run, the inaugural run, I guess you would call it, and uh, it was quite a trip. Second, I'm having a little bit of audio. You don't have a pacemaker, do you? No, I <laughs> don't no, no, no pacemakers. Okay, good, good. okay, so you're 29, you said 29 years old about this? 29, okay, yeah. So yeah, you're not a young guy, you're probably you're obviously one of the older guys in the yeah. group, but tell me about any firefights, any combat, was it around you, were you always behind it, or was it, were the times that it was, you know? It was around us quite a bit. Um, most days we had escorts, PBRs, choppers if we needed them. Um, if there were VC or NVA active in the area that we were going up the river, uh, they would try and pr provide us with coverage. But uh, and sometimes it did a lot of good, and sometimes it just aggravated them. Um, so it was never obviously we're passing through, so it was never a set two day long fight. It was just days of tension and occasional firefights. Uh, until we got help, uh, but we had enough firepower ourselves to ter pretty well take care of ourselves. What uh, always amazed me, though, is they always shot at us. They never shot at the barge, which I would have done had I been them. I would have fired a rocket into the barge and had taken, gotten rid of all of us anyway that way. Did you have friends that were in Vietnam killed or wounded during all that time? People you knew, or were you with people that were maybe wounded? Or yes. Killed? Yeah, I was. We were in a couple firefights where we had wounded and lost three men uh, over over the time. Is there a, a pretty cl uh, close knit group? A lot of camaraderie among you guys, or? Uh, you know, I'll tell you the truth. I got out and uh, uh, we moved away from uh, Virginia, the Army post, and and I just wanted away. And so I just sort of, for years, put it behind me as best I could. 
But at the time when you guys were together in Vietnam, were you guys pretty close? Oh, we were tight. Yeah, yeah well, maximum tight. And uh, we had a good unit. We had good guys. Everybody, you know, for the most part, uh, all the senior guys were volunteers. We had a lot of draftees, but they were, uh, I think they'd been weeded out, if you will, pretty good. And these guys were good at their jobs. And, and uh, we never really had any problems with... Uh, troops until we'd get back into like a secure area if we had to go into Saigon on the river to get supplies or mail or repairs or whatever that's where we saw problems we never saw them on our boat or in our units so much uh, I know there were some of the maintenance guys that had problems and that but uh, it seemed to be the people that never went in harm's way that were the are you fighting the VC, the North Vietnamese Army, or both? Both. Yeah. Both. And the uh, VC would, uh, of course, I think they'd see us coming or hear us coming up the river, and they'd just like to come out and take a pot shot or two. Uh, sometimes they would set up and, you know, try and take us out. But the, uh, like I said, most of the time we had good coverage. Uh, when we had chopper coverage, it was wonderful. <laughs> those, those guys made our life a lot easier. They would actually uh, come down low along the water, along the river banks, and just wave their props around looking for aiming sticks and made our, made our life much, much better. What do you think, Terry, was the most difficult thing that you saw or had to do in Vietnam on that tour? Uh, for me, it was, uh, we had a chopper go down right in front of me, literally, uh, one day, and uh, lost the entire crew and, and four guys, passengers that were in it, uh, Army guys, went down in the river, and uh, probably that was maybe the hardest part for me was three days later, we had to bring their bodies back, and... Uh, I've never forgotten that, ever. Did you know these guys, or? No, I knew the, <clears throat> to me the terrible part was the four passengers, they were uh, on their last day. They were taking them to uh, Saigon to leave country. And I guess the chopper pilot decided to give them a little side tour, and he came down the river and hit a power line. Just one of those terrible freak accidents. Yeah. But I often thought about uh, what their families must have thought, how they felt. You know, here they thought they were coming home that day. So, were you at a base at night? Did you go back to a base? Or you no, we, our unit actually um, was stationed on a bunch of barges, old artillery barges, and uh, built hooches on there. And uh, so we could move the unit wherever we needed to be. Uh, consequently, uh, we were a very different unit. We, we didn't have a lot of uh, ties to any one place, per se. We uh, certainly didn't have mess facilities and, and all that that most people have. Uh, we didn't get the Christmas shows and that. We were pretty much on our own. Now, the, the warrant officer, now, I'm, that's an Army um, rank. I, I familiarize, I'm so, uh, a lot of the helicopter pilots were warrant officers. Correct. Now, how, how do you get this rank, and you're not, are you in the Air Mobile Division, or what's their warrant officer ranking, what's all that's all about? Well, warrant officers uh, were just about every specialty in the, in the military. The Navy had warrant officers, the Coast Guard, the Air Force. Uh, they did away with them for a while, then they brought them back. Uh, you always went in as a W01, which was warrant officer first. Uh, if you toughed it out and cut, you know, made the grade, after a year you typically became a chief warrant officer too. Then after that, it was specifically by appointment. It's CW3, CW4, and now there's a CW5. They didn't have that when I was in, but uh, we we basically ranked just like the helicopter pilots did. 
and I was an engineer, and, but towards the end, uh, I was an engineer and skipper uh, for my boat. So you're on a boat the whole time, pretty much on the Delta, then. I was uh, eight months on the boats, and uh, then the uh, moved me into the home to the base unit as a maintenance officer. So, but my first eight months was on the river. Are there things about Vietnam and the tour that maybe you you have just put out of your mind or forgotten? I mean, or is it are the memories all pretty much there? You know, I think they're mostly there. I <laughs> um, didn't think about it or tried not to think about it for years. Why is that? We didn't come home to a very good reception, and. Um, it wasn't popular. Even though I knew we did the right things, even though I know we won, we didn't lose. The, the government, the politicians lost the war. We didn't. We kicked their butts, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, but it was so unpopular, you just hated to say that you were to acknowledge in public. You just didn't do it. And uh, when I got out, I actually let my hair grow and just got out of the way and didn't tell anybody where I came from, basically. And I certainly didn't discuss it with my family for years. And maybe that's why I'm here, is I've never discussed a lot of it with my children. Why is that now? You don't think they're interested or what? No, I think they're very interested. It's just hard to sit down and talk about. It really is. It's uh, it changed my life. It changed me. It uh, made me a different person. Uh, now expound on that. I mean, good or bad. I mean, that experience. I think a lot of good. Um, you never know how you're going to react in situations like a firefight or. Um, stress day after day after day after day um, and I'm confident I did well in, the, in that situation but the uh, I think the emotions of of losing people of seeing death of uh, being called losers when we weren't I think it made me more emotional, and I think the older I get, the more emotional I get about the whole thing. Um, it's harder. Uh, but I'm so glad that uh, you're doing this and that the, uh, the American public, I think, has finally come to accept us. As we weren't the bad guys. We were, uh, we were one of the finite steps in winning the Cold War, if you will. It had to be done, and it had to be done somewhere, and it was inevitable. It was going to be, it was a, a battle that was going to be fought somewhere. It just had to be in, in this case, in Vietnam. When you were in Vietnam, did you feel the support of the country? Did you guys feel like you're on your own, or how did you feel about that? Oh, I felt we were on our own, other than my family uh, and my unit, the guys in my unit. I think most of us felt like. We're just sort of going it alone at this point, you know. Um, we know back home that it's it's front page news all the time, and of course, naturally, when they fly you back to the country, uh, back to the world, as we used to say, we're going back to the world. We, uh, yep, they flew us into San Francisco, of all places. I'll never forget that. It was uh, nobody ever spit at me or anything like that, but I. I remember we <clears throat> went down to the USO at the airport and showered and shaved and put on dress greens and everybody had tickets to their various destinations and and uh, you're just sort of trying to stay out of the way. I think we, I, I know I was, I was a little bit of shock anyway even being back and uh, got on an airplane and had a window seat and just trying to read a book and 
be left alone. That's all I wanted, be left alone so I could get home to my family. They were in Denver at the time. And uh, a lady and little girl got on the plane and sat in the next two seats, and I thought, okay, we're cool. And when we got up in the air, she turned around and looked at me, and she said, uh, you just coming home? And I almost said no. I really did. I would, but I said, yeah, yeah, I am. She said, Vietnam? I said, yeah. <laughs> she leaned over and she kissed me, <laughs> said, welcome home. <laughs> Jeez, it was tough. Uh, what a wonderful gesture. Were you in a uniform at that time? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But I thought that was remarkable. Yeah, that was. Boy, you remember that. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Were there good things that happened in Vietnam? We hear about all the bad. <clears throat> Did you see anything good? I mean, as far as the people, the country, and things, or was it just all kind of a negative environment? I oh, no. We had um, actually had Vietnamese working with us. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, Vietnamese contractors. Uh, we hired them to help with the boats. We didn't have enough crew. So they helped crew the boats. Uh, I, I remember we had one guy that uh, he had been literally a sergeant in the French Army. I mean, he had been fighting the VC his whole life, his whole life. Uh, incredible. And they took good care of us for the most part. They really did. They, uh, and they would fight just as well as, as any GI. They weren't afraid. Uh, we had a few that infiltrated with them that became problems. We found VC in, in the unit, in our own unit. And we couldn't figure out sometimes how they knew where we were going. Oh, well, then we discovered. <laughs> they who professed not to speak English, in fact, sometimes did. And uh, would listen in on conversations. And, uh, and I remember there was a camp, uh, Davies, in Sa outside Saigon, that had a barber shop. And it turned out the barbers were all VC, and were telling their friends about unit movements and stuff because guys go in the barber shop and just talk. You never think about that, but it's great. Right? But I, these people, um, and I was able to uh, eat with them sometimes, and and that, and um, and they were marvelous people. Uh, they certainly didn't deserve the ending that they got, uh, and they and they didn't want the ending they got. That's for sure, as evidenced by things that happened later. But uh, very kind, uh, maybe too kind, almost. I think it was hard for them sometimes to to stand up and be counted, but a good number of them were willing and did, but they just never quite got it all together. Yeah. Very unfortunate. Yeah, that is, yeah. Yeah, when they lost our, you know, when we lost the political support and the support of the people at home, they were doomed and they didn't deserve that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Let's see, what's I going to ask you about? Um, so you're there for one tour, which is what's common, a year, a year there. Right. You, know, you come home and, um, you know, were you in any major engagements? I mean, the 69, 70 time frame, there were a lot of things happening, but were you pretty much just on, on the tugboat, you said, and on the river there? Yeah, probably the worst and major engagement was when we went to Tain Inn, that first run to Tain Inn, when we got to... Uh, we actually got into Tain Inn. We made that run unescorted. Number one, it was a two and a half day run. It was a long trip. Uh, we had to, you know, you don't stop or run on the river at night. We'd find a place to hold up during the day. And we had one barge of ammo, one barge of avgas. And the, the river kept getting narrower and narrower and narrower. And we got up in Nui Bao Din, the Black Virgin Mountain was right here. And there was a Navy uh, gunboat base that we were trying to get into. And uh, by now the river was quite narrow. Uh, and it was just an incredibly hot spot 
uh, the NVA were coming out and coming across the line that night, um, literally in company and battalion strength, I think, uh, testing things and testing the people. And we pulled in and finally found a place to, they didn't have piers enough for us, you know, for the big, these big barges, so we pushed them in the best we could and got them tied up and, and all the gunboats and monitors and everybody were going out for the night and you could tell it was going to heat up and uh, we pulled back around and <clears throat> found this a pier where one of these gunboats had left and uh, tied up and only this navy lieutenant i remember he come running down and he was screaming at us what are you doing what are you doing we're going to tie up for the night oh no you're not why not he said you guys draw too much fire and I've got enough trouble already. And we told him, we said, Lieutenant, we can help you more than we can hurt you. Look at the firepower we've got and we're good at it. And he said, push come to shove, he came down and he literally, he ordered us out of there. And we went across the river, uh, found a mud bank and we drove the boat up into the mud bank and tied, had a guy jump off the bow and tie us off to a tree. And we spent the night there, and Jesus, they were everywhere. They were sw swimmers in the water. They just uh, came out of the woods. It was a long night. What are they firing? AK-47s? Or... AK-47s and uh, some RPGs, mostly. And uh, just testing things. They never Looking. had an air cover or nothing like that? No, yeah. no, no. We were the fortunate ones. Yeah. But I do, uh, We the next morning we went back to that Navy base and I found that lieutenant and told him, that we're still here. <laughs> so thanks for nothing. <laughs> but um, those poor guys up there that stayed there all time, that was tough for them. But because of our success in making that tow, we went back again, and then finally they decided to rotate it let everybody have their share, if you will. So, but that was a hot area, hot, hot. Geez, you couldn't help but feel for the guys that were stationed there full time. Uh, did you ever ha have to help anybody that was wounded, or did you have medics, or what? Well, we had to do our own. We didn't have any medics. Um, we had, um, yeah, we <laughs> had a boat right in front of us that. Uh, we, we all took fire and they had two wounded and we had, we finally got up beside them and jettisoned some barges that we had and figured we'd catch up with them and, and helped with those guys. Uh, but uh, like I said, for the most part, you know, we were, we were lucky. We really were. We had good people and good coverage and I think you had more stress than firefights but we had our fair share too. Were there times you were afraid, scared, fearful and um, was there a lot of uncertainty about what you did? Certainly a lot of uncertainty the first two or three weeks until you get the feel for what you're doing. I had no idea what I was going to be doing when I got there. I had no idea I was going to end up on a basically an armored tug. Um, uh, there were times, certainly, when I was scared, scared to death. But uh, you're the warrant. <laughs> you can't be. So we did our job. But later you would just be amazed at yourself almost that, <coughs> that you didn't hyperventilate and do something stupid. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I think that came with thankfully being a little bit older and maybe a little more mature and, and adjusting to it. But uh, 
saw more than I cared to see. Okay. Yeah, but I think that was true of just about everybody. Um, I, I felt like we did a wonderful job because uh, the, we were trying to take care of guys that were that were on the line every every day. We were we were exposed to it, and we had moments, and we had scares, and we had fright, and we lost a few people, and we we did things that even I can't believe sometimes. But but the guys that we were trying to support were the ones that were twenty four seven. How close did you get to the enemy at one time? Like we are, or were they always at a distance? Always a distance. Um, probably closest 25 yards mm -hmm. ever, and that was in Tain in in the did river. You, did you have a weapon with you? I always carried a 60, an M60. I've said it. I needed when I was the engineer. I wanted, needed, wanted to be close to the engine room in case we had a problem or took a rocket hit in the engine room or something. So we had a. 50 and 60 on each side, top side, and then I had a 60 cal that I set up on the bow, which was good because the bow was heavily armored. <laughs> it was a very nice place, and uh, on the cover, had a lot of had a lot of firepower. On the cover of the Vietnam film, is that an M60? Uh, yes. 60. Yeah, yeah, it's sort of a Rambo weapon, but it's a good one. Um, I would think that would be heavy to carry that around. Not too bad. No. Not too bad. Not when you're 29 and <laughs> full of yourself. <laughs> so it was not bad at do, all. Do you think when people are younger, there's an invincibility about life? They feel like nothing can happen to them, and especially like in war and combat at times. And then there's a baptism under fire, as it were. I mean, I don't know if you experienced yeah. that, but I mean, maybe some of the combat troops did. Or oh yeah, absolutely. I think nobody. Nobody, uh, certainly I didn't ever think uh, for a moment that it could happen to me. And uh, and I know the guys I worked with, uh, served with, you just always think it's going to be somebody else. But when you see it in front of your eyes, you realize it's, but for a fraction of a second, but for a, a foot away, but for a, a fluke, a fate, uh, just, he got his ticket punched and you didn't, and you, if you didn't believe in God before you went, you certainly believed in God when you, when you walked out of there, so. Do you remember your last day in Vietnam and uh, what it was like, and maybe did you see troops coming in while you left? I mean, t describe your last day there. Oh, <laughs> Myself and another warrant officer um, were leaving on the same day, and uh, they sent us to uh, Tonsonut and uh, told us that our flight had been delayed. Our incoming flight was actually bringing in fresh troops, and uh, we were on a charter flight, Pan Am I think it was. So they uh, said we could go get lunch somewhere. Well, we asked if there was an officer's club. We hadn't seen an officer's club in months. <coughs> oh yeah, and uh, we went to this officer's club, walked in, and I remember it was carpeted, wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, and had chandeliers. And we were amazed that people lived like that. We couldn't believe that. And uh, we had a very nice lunch, we went back. And what I always remember uh, other than the excitement of actually leaving, was they put us in a big room. They put the entire group of people leaving on that flight in one room, surrounded by MPs, and gave us a lecture on what you couldn't take out of country. And they said, we're going to go down this passageway one by one. There's booths on each side. There was an MP at each of these booths. There was maybe a dozen booths. And they will stop you at random, take you in the booth, and do a total body search of you and your possessions. So before you get to the hallway, there's a 55-gallon drum on each side of the door. If you have anything, we suggest you put it in there. Needless to say, you could hear things hitting in the barrels as people went through. But uh, 
then they, as you fed through that pack, I did not get searched. Uh, it wouldn't have made any difference. I didn't have any of the paraphernalia they were looking for. They were looking for pictures of enemy troops or uh, weapons or drugs, that type of thing. But they didn't want you bringing home anything that showed the war in a bad light. That was very specific. Um, then you ended up in another room identical to the first room and it was also guarded and then the bus came, buses came, we could see our aircraft out on the tarmac and you walked through a cordon of MPs to get on the buses. Then the buses drove out to the ramp up to the aircraft and MPs were out there and then went up the ramp onto the aircraft. They were guarded, protected, directed the entire, I mean, it was all orchestrated. They did not want, to, they wanted you leaving the country the way they wanted you leaving the country and not with a bunch of extra goodies. And I always thought that was very strange after what all we'd been through and then to treat people like, I, th I guess there was certainly reasons for it but it seemed very strange at the time. But on the other hand, you were going home, so you didn't care. <laughs> you, know. you ever been to the Vietnam Wall in Washington, D.C.? No, I went to the traveling wall when it came through here. Uh, we want to go back. It's really tough. I can, I saw where you had been and some of the guys had gone and, uh, I can imagine the emotion of it. The traveling wall to me was bad enough. It was just, I don't know what, it just wells up in you and it's the emotion of seeing all those names. It's just, I, I can't imagine going to the real wall, but I want to. You've heard me ask the question, I want to ask you this question though, but Terry, what does freedom mean to you? Oh, everything. Uh, Freedom is what we're doing right now, I guess. It's the ability to talk about the good and the bad. It's the uh, ability to live where we live because we want to, not because we're forced to. It's, uh, I had the freedom to go, I could choose good roads or bad roads and for my life. And I um, fortunately chose a lot of good roads and I was in the right places at the right time. Uh, it was the freedom to, for our daughters to go off and marry and live where they want to live. And it's so many things and it, uh, freedom's a very emotional thing to me. It's, uh, I'm the guy that cries during the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, I mean, I just, uh, I love this country more than my life. It's just, that important to me. And about the price of freedom, the cost for our freedoms, what would you tell a young person today about <clears throat> the price for freedom? You know, they're born in a free country, they don't realize yeah. what it takes, but what would you tell a young person about the price for freedom? It's high. Uh, a lot of people paid the price for freedom. Uh, if I had <clears throat> an opportunity, I would tell them, you need to spend an hour with a World War II vet or spend an hour with a Korean vet or a Vietnam vet. But right now I think that <clears throat> the pressure needs to be on and sit down and talk to World War II veterans. Those guys are incredible. Uh, just, they're amazing. I, I love them to death. I know a lot of uh, World War II submarine veterans who are, oh, just, uh, it's going to be terrible when they, we lose them all. It's going to be a sad day. And the Korean vets <clears throat> who didn't get the recognition they deserved, you know, that's, the countdown is on for them now. And, uh, and those guys went through hell for freedom, our freedom, and the freedom of another country. It's like the troops are doing in uh, Iraq.
in Afghanistan. But thankfully, we have people that are willing to pay the price to lay down their life for others. I think it's what makes us human. What does the American flag mean and represent to you as a veteran? Oh, I'm that guy again. <laughs> the American flag uh, goes by. I, uh, I love the stars and stripes. I do. I have it everywhere. I have the lighted flag in front of my house. Uh, not to show off, but just to show pride of country. And, uh, you know, I, when people disrespect the flag and don't stand up and don't salute, I just don't understand it. They have no concept of what's, uh, what's happened to preserve that flag and the people that have given all to preserve that flag. Maybe they understand it, or maybe they know. Uh, maybe they know it. Maybe they saw it in school. Maybe they saw it in a movie, but they have no appreciation. If they truly appreciated it, they would salute it every chance they got. Do you think our country's losing that spirit of patriotism? <coughs> or do you think it's being rekindled? I mean, how do you feel about that? You know, I thought on 9/11. Uh, the Veterans Day Parade here, as an example, was the biggest parade in years, and uh, it, it was like uh, all of a sudden the old fire had been lit again uh, to be American, to be strong, to be proud, but now it's drug on again, uh, and it goes in fits and spurts, but I, th I th to me, I see a lot of reason to have hope. I really do. Uh, there's more and more people, and maybe it's just where we live, I don't know, but I, I, I feel good about some of the things I see around here. Uh, the people, the spirit, the recognition of veterans, the flag waving, the flag saluting. Uh, I'm not sure that's true everywhere, but certainly here. What do you think our country should remember about Vietnam? I think Vietnam needs to be remembered as a major, major stepping stone in our struggle to win the Cold War. I think uh, even though people call it a loss, the fact is, we had to do that. We did. We, we had to face that test and prove to the communist nations that we were willing to come over there and fight, and fight for the right thing, for the right cause. Uh, yes, it became unpopular, but it was certainly recognized by other countries as the fact that we stood up and were counted at the right time. And uh, even though some people say, well, we abandoned them. Yeah, we did, but we, the military, didn't abandon them. Uh, and I think uh, Russia and China in particular, of course, realize that uh, we're willing to go the next step. And it had to be done. It was that time. It was that place. Um, quite frankly, I'm glad I did it. Are you proud that you're a Vietnam veteran? Absolutely. <clears throat> I can say that now. <laughs> I am, and I, but I am. I am. I uh, took a lot of things and buried them a long, long time ago. Uh, but I'm happy and proud now to say I am a Vietnam veteran. Uh, certainly proud. Uh, proud of every person that was over there. Proud of what we did. I wish it had turned out <coughs> a 
different. I wish the majority had not listened so much to the minority and that uh, we had done it, uh, had a better ending, a happier ending. But, um, yeah, it was one of the proudest moments of my life. You mentioned that incident on the plane, but after, after that, years later, have people thanked you for your service? You know, finally, uh, yeah. Um, my biggest thank you came when the, uh, my personal thank you came, I think, when uh, they opened the Vietnam Memorial in Fruta. That was a huge day. Emotional day. Uh, it's like a weight lifted off. Um, I had not been to the, to the wall, uh, the, so that was my wall, and it is my wall. And I still go out there. Just stop and walk around. So, yeah. What are you thinking about when you're out for the, the, the memorial? I've been out there. I think about the guys I served with, I, I think about the names, I think about, um, I don't know, just different things. It's, um, <laughs> you know, uh, the river, the, the choppers coming in, the, it's the noises and the smells. Uh, are those sights, sounds, and smells that bring back memories of Vietnam? We heard a helicopter earlier, but does all that bring it back a little bit? A little bit. Every time I hear a chopper, it's, you know, as you know, the chopper is the, the sound of Vietnam, and it was, and it is to this day in my mind. Uh, I remember we had this one group that used to run escort for us sometimes, and they had kill painted on the bottom of their fuselage, and they would... When we would call them in, the first thing they'd do is sweep up the river and come right over the boat and sort of plane up. And that's, of course, what we'd see is kill, kill. But they guys were incredible, incredible. Uh, I remember running into them and some of those chopper pilots uh, in a Quonset hut, little O club at a fire support base one time. and. Uh, we got to talking, and oh, you, oh, you're that, oh, you're that guy, <laughs> you're on that helicopter, oh, you're on that boat, you know, one of those conversations. And uh, so we said, well, they said, well, why don't you come ride with us? And we said, never, no, you guys are crazy. We are no, <laughs> but you can come ride with us. And they thought we were crazy. So it was a mutual admiration society. They thought we were nuts. And we thought they were nuts. <laughs> What does Veterans Day mean to you? Veterans Day is, um, I, I think it's one of, a wonderful day. Uh, it's, um, particularly now that we have the parade and, and uh, you know, you drive ride down the street. What I love to do is uh, I ride down the street with some other veterans and I like to pick out the, the veterans in the crowd, you know, and thank them because people are waving and thanking us, but I like to point out the, the veterans in the crowd because you pick them out in their hats and their shirts and that. And, uh, they're not out there in the parade, but they're certainly there, and I, I love that part of it. It's a great day. It's a, it's a fun day to celebrate being a veteran and remembering veterans and remembering those who, who gave their all. And, but mostly recognition of the ones that are standing there in the crowd waving a flag. I agree. Well, you've seen my documentaries. At the end, I asked the veteran to give me a salute. <laughs> yep. The camera line. I tell you, can you do that? From where you see it right there. Okay, tell me right into the camera. Go ahead. Great. Thanks. Yeah.